So I'm wondering, how are y'all doing? <laughs> like really? Yeah. Like how, how are you doing? When people ask me that now, it's never been more complicated to answer than in my whole life. People say, so how are you doing? And I just like, I pause and I hesitate and all these thoughts go through my mind. Like, should I tell you the truth? Or should I answer it contextually? Like, how am I doing based on all the stuff that's going on right now? Like, how are you doing? It's a complicated question to answer. I saw a post on social media, somebody uh, put this up, they said, what one word best describes your emotional state? And then in parentheses, it said, no cuss words. Ha, <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> no cuss words. What would you say to answer that question if there would be one word to summarize your emotional state, no cuss words, what would that word be? I went and I asked some of my friends, like, hey, what, if there's one word that would describe what you're feeling right now. Um, one guy, he just looked at me and he said, numb. I just feel numb. Uh, a couple of people said things like they were angry. Um, a couple of people said they're irritated. Um, some have said they're anxious or afraid. Uh, I think for me, if there would be one word to summarize uh, my emotional state right now, it would, it would be just the word unsettled. Unsettled. Everything feels unsettling to me. Even like the small things. Like it used to be easy just to go up and greet somebody. Now, I don't know about you, but like I'm measuring it out. Like, what, what are you? Are you a strict six footer? Or do you say screw all that and you're coming in for the hug? I don't know how to approach you. Are we knuckle bumping? Are we awkward? Or, or do, 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 do I need my mask? Do I not need my, I don't, I don't know, it's, it's awkward. Even the little things like that. And then there's the big things, the economic uncertainty and the racial tension and the political division. And everybody's so emotional. Anybody? Type it in the chat, y'all are crazy. Just type that in there. Y'all, everybody, y'all are crazy. So emotional. So what I thought we'd do over the next few weeks is dive into the theme of emotions, but not just talk about emotions, but talk about them from a gospel-centered perspective. God has given us emotions, they are from God. And so what I wanna do is I wanna look at the emotions of Jesus, what he endured, what he felt, and let his emotions help center our emotions that we're not just reacting, but we're responding with gospel-centered emotions. So I did a little research into the emotions of Jesus. And one article I read said that, there, that Jesus in the four gospels, he actually displayed 39 different emotions, 39 emotions. I didn't know for years that there were a total of 39 different emotions until I had teenage daughters. And then I could see all 39 in a 30 second conversation. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was God and yet he was a human being and he expressed and felt very real emotions. I'll give you some examples. For example, whenever Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he saw all these people that he loved, that God loved, and they were disconnected from God, he felt this deep, sincere emotion of grief. They're missing out on the very thing God wants for them. Whenever there were religious leaders that cared more about the rules and the law than people, he felt this righteous anger toward the hypocrisy and the sin and the lack of love. Whenever 72 followers came back and were talking about how God had used them to make a difference, he felt the, the, the overwhelming sense of being overjoyed at the faithfulness of God through his people. When his friend Lazarus died, even though he knew he had the power of life to raise Lazarus from the dead, Jesus felt the emotion of just profound sadness and wept over the death of his close friend. Before going to the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew what was about to come and he felt lonely, anxiety. He felt overwhelmed knowing the pain that was to come. 
What I wanna do today to start our series on emotions is I wanna look at one of the emotions of Jesus, what he feels toward us and believe that that will help us to express that emotion toward others. We're gonna look in Luke's gospel today and to give you the context, we'll be in Luke chapter seven. We'll start in verse 11. And Jesus had just finished preaching his famous message known as the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 11 says that soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to a village of Nain and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming as he approached the village and the young man who had died was a widow's only son. Somebody say only son. And a large crowd followed the village was with her. When the Lord, when Jesus saw her, here's the emotion. His heart overflowed with compassion. He looked at this woman, he said, don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. And the bearers stopped. Young man, Jesus said, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Luke says that great fear swept the crowd and they praised God saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people today. The power of Jesus expressed through deep and sincere compassion. Let's try to visualize this if if you can. Jesus is walking up and there's a funeral procession that would be a lot different than ours today. There were no police officers with you know, bright lights and such. What there would have been very likely, quite honestly, is mourners. Some of them might've been professional mourners. It wasn't uncommon to pay people to go and they would take flutes and tambourines and they would walk down the streets and they would play the instruments and they would wail in sadness, ah, representing the grief of this type of loss. And so Jesus walks up on this very emotional, most likely very loud scene. And there's some things we know, a lot of things we don't know. For example, we don't know about this poor grieving single mom. We don't know how old she is. She might've been 23, she might've been in her late 30s. We don't know how her husband died. Was it an accident? Was it, did he have some kind of sickness? We we don't know. We don't know how old the boy was. Was he a three-year-old? Was he a 12-year-old? We really don't know. What we do know is most likely the little boy had died the day before. And the reason we know this is because back in this time in history, they didn't have formaldehyde and the same types of quality embalming ingredients that we would have today. And because of the climate, whenever a person died, the burial would be very, very quickly, almost always the next day. So if you can imagine, you've got this young mom who's already lost her husband this boy's father, and now she's a widow and she loses her only son. Emotional, overwhelmed with grief. At her deepest moment of pain, verse 13 says, the Lord Jesus saw her. He saw her. What's really interesting is there's over 40 references in the gospels that were told that Jesus saw someone, which is funny to me. Over 40 times we say, it says Jesus saw somebody because you would think he saw everybody, right? Unless he was like praying, but he actually might've seen him if he's praying because he said, watch him pray. (laughs) Is what you should do if you're praying while you're driving, watch him pray. So he saw a lot of people, but what the author's telling us is he didn't just see, he noticed. Have you noticed there's a difference between looking and seeing? I'm a guy, man, like I can like, I can like look and just not see. I don't always notice, which is really difficult for me because I'm married to Amy Noticer of Rochelle. <laughs> and if you're married to somebody like that, okay, she notices everything. I, I've trained myself to notice, like 
Uh, one time I saw her, but I didn't notice she had her hair done. She had her hair cut. So now, just a little marriage tip. What you just say is like two, three times a week. Like, wow, did you do something to your hair? Just, just, just say that. It's, it's, just, it's just a good thing. Just, you, wow, you, you know, your hair looks great. Did you do something to it? You just say that two, three times a week. Okay? Because she notices everything. Well, I could come over to your house and, and we leave and she's like, did you notice their wallpaper? It was amazing. I'm like, they had walls? I didn't notice that. <laughs> weddings are the worst. My gosh, weddings. I had no idea. There are 43 million things to notice at a wedding. I noticed one thing, food or no food. That's all I noticed. Do you notice the flowers? Do you notice the way the mom looked at the, you know, notice the, did you see the, you know, oh, okay. They're, they're, Jesus, Jesus looks on. He doesn't just, just, just see, but he he sees her, he saw her, he noticed her. She was a single mom, a widow, who lost her husband, and now she loses her only son. And in the middle of all this chaos, Jesus looks on at her. The Lord saw her. What emotion did Jesus feel when he saw someone in deep and profound pain. What Jesus felt is the very same thing that he feels for you whenever you're hurting. What he felt for her was the very same thing that he feels for you. When you're afraid, when your marriage is struggling, when you're trying to pay your bills and you don't know how you're gonna pay your bills, Whenever you're praying and praying and praying for a child who's making crazy decisions and you're aching, hoping, believing your child will be okay, Jesus feels the very same thing for you when you're hurting as he did for this woman who was in pain. When the Lord saw her, scripture says, verse 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. There wasn't enough room even in his heart for all the compassion that he felt. His heart overflowed with compassion. Uh, the root Greek word that's translated as compassion is a really cool word. The word is splagna. Everybody say splagna. S-P-L-A-G-N-A. You can type that in the chat. Splagna. I like that word. I like it a lot. It, it sounds like, have you ever stuck your finger down your throat? And you so magna everywhere. That's what it sounds like. And the truth is, that's very much what it's like because this word, it means to feel from the guts or from the intestines. There is no stronger word in the Greek language to represent the depth of compassion, feeling for someone else from the bowels. I read one article about this word and, and the picture the author said was, imagine driving up on a car wreck. Surely you've probably had this at some point and you have this sinking feeling, oh, I hope they're okay. Then you notice maybe two people that are um, injured by the side of the road and the first responders are trying to attend to them and you're like, oh God, I hope they're gonna live. And you feel for them. Then you recognize the car and know the two people are two people you love. That's splagna. It's the depths of, it's hurting from the guts, from the inside. The Lord saw her pain. He noticed. He felt it in his bowels and he cared. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but the Lord our God knows what you're going through and he cares about you more than you could imagine. He sees your pain. He hears the cries of your heart. He knows when you feel desperate. He knows when you can't catch a breath, when your heart rate pounds and you feel so much anxiety that you can barely even find your next breath. The Lord sees you. He knows that pain. When you're praying for your marriage, when you don't know where you're gonna find your next job, when, when, when you feel anxious, when you feel frustrated, when you feel afraid, the Lord sees you. He notices and he cares. Jesus sees this grieving single mom. He hurts with her. 
He grieves for her. And then in verse 13, he says this. He says to her, don't cry. Don't cry. And he walks over to the coffin and he touched it and the bearers stopped. He touched it. He touched the coffin. What's really interesting, the coffin wouldn't be anything like the coffins that um, we see today. Uh, these coffins were, like ours would have like a side and a lid on it. These coffins would generally be like a flat piece of wood on some wheels, kind of like a buggy. And they'd put the body on top of the coffin and the body would almost always be exposed. So when Jesus goes up and he touches the coffin, this was shocking. Like this was completely scandalous. This was unheard of. This was, this was the, the, pe people would gasp everywhere because the Pharisees, they had all these religious laws, these rules, and most of the rules were all concerned with the outside. Like, here's the show I want you to see. Here's the, here's the image. It's all, I wanna portray something. I may not be on the inside, but I'm gonna show you outwardly that I'm incredibly religious. They had 613 of these very distinct, very strict laws, one of which was you don't touch a dead body or you don't touch anything that touched a dead body. Because if you touch a dead body, or if anything touches that dead body and you touch what touches the dead body, you become unclean, just like the, you're ceremonially unclean. Jesus, this prophet claiming to be the son of God, touches something to make him spiritually unclean. When Jesus touched the coffin, what he did was he crossed a line. I love this about Jesus. Jesus is a line crosser. He is a rule breaker. Every time religion would draw a line, Jesus would cross that line. Why? Because love crosses lines. Whatever line that you feel right now, maybe keeping God at a distance, you need to understand, He crosses lines for those that He loves. Jesus is a line crosser. He is a rule breaker. What religion does, distorted religion, the, the religiosity, the legalism, that's all about rules and not about love. What it does is it draws lines to keep people out. The tragedy is that's the very thing that kept some of you or someone you love from the things of God. I don't wanna go to that church because they're a bunch of legalists and ruined, they're a bunch of hypocrites and stuff. And that's what religion wrongly does with good intentions, it draws lines. And, and, and if, if that part of the church bothers you, it bothered Jesus too. Jesus didn't want any line, any external rule to keep people from experiencing Him, His love, His grace, His power. And that's why we don't draw lines to keep people out. We cross lines to bring people in. That's what we do, that's what we do. That's why we will open up a church in the middle of a, a global pandemic. We'll open up a new campus because we believe people need the grace of Jesus. So ignoring the religious policies, Jesus touches the coffin, perhaps even touches this boy. No boundaries, no rules, no laws can keep Jesus from expressing the depth of the compassion that he feels for those who are hurting. Jesus touches the boy. And imagine the crowd gasps, scandalous. How can you do this? But more incredibly, the boy gasped. He took a breath and he started talking. Somebody ought to give God some praise right now because whatever feels dead in your life right now, with one touch of Jesus, it can come back to life. Somebody here, that's what you need today. You need one touch, just one touch, just one touch from the author of life, the giver of life, brings dead things back to life. Just one touch, just one moment just one word, just one sense that not only is He with you, but He cares. What did it take to completely alter this boy and his grieving mom? Just 
one touch. My prayer is today, somebody watching online, somebody who came back into church for the first time, that there would be one moment, one word, one song, one prayer, one sense of the goodness and the grace of God crossing whatever barrier that you feel has separated you and know that our God crosses lines to show his love. Just one touch. The Lord saw her, he cared, and he touched. Just one touch. Just one, just one touch. Just one. And it's almost impossible to describe what this did for this grieving widow because moments before, she had nothing. Not, not, not only did she lose those she loved, but she couldn't even support herself. In, in, the, in this culture, uh, if you didn't have a husband or you didn't have a son, those, those were your means of support. As, as crazy as it is, the women just weren't allowed and didn't have the ability to create any kind of means to even feed themselves. And so she would have had basically two options. One is she's a beggar, dependent on other people for the rest of her life or the other is much worse and she'd have to use her bodies in ways that would be unthinkable just to have something to eat. And so Jesus touches this boy. He comes back to life and Jesus carries the boy to this single mom. And not only does he give her her son back, but he gives her hope back. It's my prayer today they're for somebody who feels anxious and somebody who feels afraid and somebody who feels bitter and irritated and agitated and always on guard or for someone who even feels unsettled like me that with just one touch, God would give you your hope back. Just one touch, just one touch. Just one touch, just one touch. I wasn't expecting this. I don't have the words to tell you how much I love you, my church family. And we're all making the best of this time. What I know right now is like, there's some of you wanna to come to church, some of you can't, some forgot about. And I love this place so much. I love the presence of God so much. There's something about it. And it's a complicated time, but I just, I grieve knowing how disconnected people can be spiritually. And what's really interesting is I have had um, undeniable passion to preach and haven't wavered in my faith at all, but I've had the most spiritually dry season of ministry since the pandemic started. And for me, it goes back into um, February, when I was kind of at a point of exhaustion, truthfully, and I had some time off coming in March. Well, forget that. (laughs) And then I had some time coming off again in uh, the summer, and I had to preach two messages from vacation and in the middle of a really complicated season. And all this time, I never once wavered, but I just couldn't hear from God. Like, I couldn't hear from God. And I was making decisions about the church that are very complicated, and I was making them kind of on faith, like, well, this feels like it's right, and this seems like it's right. And I just, like, God, just give me anything, just one word. Like, I just couldn't hear from God. And it didn't, like, make me afraid that he's not there at all. It didn't make me feel like he didn't love me. I was never, I was never at that place. I just, 
felt like heaven was silent. Every year, I, um, I ask God to give me a word for the year. And this year, I couldn't find a word. I, God, I, every, my whole, what's your word? Like, ah, it's so good, I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't have a word. Like, and it just a one word that helps, uh, one, word, one year of my word was focus, one year it was enjoyment, one year it was rest, one year it was big faith. You know, that's two, but that's what mine was. Jesus, Amy's was Jesus, which is really unfair, because like, what's your word gonna be? Hers is Jesus, she wins, you know, but that's her. Jesus, okay. And so I, could, I couldn't even hear that, I, not one word. And so I just cried out to God nonstop, just, just anything. And I was listening to a book. It wasn't even a Christian book, it was just a book. And I heard one word and it wasn't audible, but it was so loud, it was almost audible. And I just heard the word steady. And when I heard it, I'm telling you, I, I sat down, I was in the kitchen, I just sat down and I just stopped. Like, there you are God, there you are God. I can lead with steady faith, I can preach, with steady endurance. I can show back up not knowing exactly what to do and how to respond, and I can, I can have a steady confidence in the faithfulness of God. And so if you wanna know what have I heard from God in the last six months? One word. And that's all I needed. Just one touch. So if I look steady at all, it's because I've experienced the goodness of one word from God. So how you doing? If you could describe your emotional state in one word, what would you say? Unsettled, anxious, afraid, desperate, hopeless, tense, irritated, agitated, frustrated? Cry out to the God who is moving towards you as you speak. Whatever line you feel separates you from his goodness, Know that he's stepping across that line. He is a rule breaker who cares about you. And there is nothing that's going to keep him from pursuing you, from reaching out to you, from loving you, from showing you his grace and his goodness. He's coming for you. To show you, he notices, he sees. and he cares about you more than you can imagine. When this widow's only son experienced the resurrection life from the only son of God, there was nothing that was dead that his compassion couldn't bring back to life, get your hope back, get your hope back, get your hope back, he's coming for you, he cares about you. Just one touch. So Father, today we pray in the name of the one who is resurrection life, that you would touch God, those who are hurting, those who are afraid, those who are confused, those who feel alone, and those who feel lost. At all of our churches today, those of you who are, who are streaming somewhere online, if you say, yeah, I really wanna experience his compassion, I wanna know that he cares. I want just one touch. If that's you, just lift up your hand or type it in the chat right now. I, I want just one touch. Father, I pray for those who may, um, feel like I felt, kind of like heaven was silent. That you just crack it open and send one beam of light, one word, one song, one moment, one word of encouragement, one prayer, one scripture, God, just one word. And God, that we would recognize, believe it, take it to the bank, 
that you notice God. You see the pain. You care from the depths of compassion. And God, as you love us, give us that same type of compassion, God, for those who are hurting, broken, afraid, and lost. God, give us to that, your church, give us that, God, that we could show your compassion to those who need your love. God, make us line crossers, rule breakers, not drawing lines to keep people out, but God, crossing lines, doing whatever it takes, anything short of sin, God, to reach people who don't know your son, Jesus. God, for those who are hurting today, God, reveal to them just how much you notice, just how much you care. God, give them just one touch. As you keep praying today at, um, at all of our different churches, there are those of you, you're gonna recognize that you have a very real and a, a very deep spiritual need. And one of the things that I am thankful for in this complicated season is that there are, are many of you that are starting to ask spiritual questions that maybe you didn't ask earlier. And let me try to just explain this as clearly as I can to you. It doesn't matter what you're doing in your life right now, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter those dark secrets, 